I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Uh, welcome to our school board webinar tonight. We are uh, happy to have with us Lisa Cummins, who was a state school board member here in Utah uh, for four years, almost four years. You, two and a half. Two and a half. Two and a half. Close, we'll round up to four years. She she wound up having to move to Texas, and so we miss her greatly. Um, but I can't fault her for moving to Texas. So, <laughs> uh, and we have with us Jenny Earl, who is a current school board member, and that was my dog. If you heard that little bark, um, Jenny is uh, from the Cache Valley area, and uh, we're great, grateful yeah, to have I'm her. in Morgan area. Morgan. But I do represent Cache Valley, Northern Utah, uh, okay. Box Elder Ridge, Cache, Cache, and Morgan, and now a little bit of Summit County. Oh, um, wow. Okay. They shifted it. So. And we have one more board member who has been at the Capitol uh, today, and she sent me a message just a little bit ago that she was on her way home. So she's going to be joining us late. And so we'll see if, if she's able to uh, punch in in a little bit. So in our uh, chat, uh, we've now, we're now up to 25 attendees and we're grateful to have you here tonight. My name is Oak Norton and uh, I, I've been involved in education issues in Utah for uh, nearly 20 years now. It's kind of weird to think it's been that long. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on um, get to know you stuff. But I'll just say I got started because I, like like many others, hit a tipping point where I couldn't take anymore. I had to do something. And um, some things had happened in our, our local school district over 20 years ago. I only became aware of it because it started affecting my family. Uh, my oldest um, was uh, hitting third grade, and I found out my school district was no longer teaching the times tables or long division. And as an accountant, I couldn't comprehend that. And so um, I, I wound up getting involved and uh, have been um, just grateful for the associations of uh, great people like Lisa and Jenny here and many others and all the, the great work that's been done by so many people. And so tonight what we want to do is... Um, hopefully not scare any of you away from wanting to uh, run for a, a school board position. Um, we're going to, I'm going to uh, put up in just a minute, a, uh, a very short PowerPoint that'll just have our agenda for tonight on it. And we'll, we'll have kind of an informal discussion here and then we'll take some questions. And so if you have specific questions that aren't going to be covered on the agenda or something that, you really want to ask Lisa or Jenny or I about, um, go ahead and at the bottom of your screen, you'll see Q&A. And so just punch into that real quick and you'll see there's a place for you to ask a question. Um, I'll just say, you know, hold off until you start to see what our agenda is. And, uh, you know, we may answer your question. Um, so with that, um, oh, Wendy Hart is indicating that, um, well, maybe you got the notice already that she just is wondering if she needs to be a panelist versus a... Yep, I'm adding okay. her now. So, Wendy, okay, okay. Well, here she comes. There we go. Wendy is the one on my right <laughs> in that picture as she is uh, tuned in here. <laughs> Wendy, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, awesome. So, Wendy... Um, Wendy's been involved in uh, my uh, school district area for as long as I have, and she was a local uh, district board member here, and so we're really grateful to have her on this call as well. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and I've got the uh, Q&A up to the side. If you have questions as we're going along, feel free to drop something in there. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen now. And we'll get this started. All right. So 
school board race discussion. This is what uh, we want to cover tonight. There's just a few points. And, you know, like I said, ask, ask questions as we go, and we'll just kind of round robin this. We want to talk about the role of board members and why that's critical. Uh, the importance of understanding principles and issues. There's going to be, you know, those those are two separate things. We'll talk a little about principles, a little about issues, but we don't want to spend a ton of time on those things. I feel like you're already here. You already know what's going on and the the insanity that we see and the importance of people that can stand for principles being in office. Um, we want to talk about organizing a campaign and, and running that. And then two types of um, uh, dealing with others. One is with fellow board members while maintaining your principles if they don't share those principles. And then dealing with opposition outside the board that can come from media or other groups. And so we're going to talk about those things first. And then um, right after that, I'll I have links to a couple of resources for you that cover uh, training and things that uh, training for board members from uh, it's a center for, let's see, a leadership institute. We'll, we'll get to that, but this is going to be the, the bulk of where we want to spend our time. So critical role of board members. I'm, I'm going to kind of moderate this a little bit and, uh, rotate through our other board members here that have been board members. I can tell you from my perspective as an outsider who attended a, a number of board meetings, uh, you know, a long time ago, um, having, having allies on a board when you come as a parent is, it, it makes you feel much more empowered. Uh, that's, that was my perspective coming into it. I always, you know, when I first started going to board meetings, it was like me, the parent against seven. And that felt, uh, you know, a little overwhelming because I'd never been to a board meeting when I first started going. And I, I started raising some serious issues and I felt really awkward. And so um, I, I was much more appreciative knowing that I had at least one ally on that board, it, it gave me some more courage as a parent. And so um, let's just kind of go through our, our board members here and talk just a little bit about your perspective of being on the board and how, how you might have felt like that helped other parents when they knew that you were an ally on the board. And I'm just going to go down my uh, view list here. So Lisa, you're going to be first on this one. You're muted. Um, so what it was like to be a board member, um, you know, sometimes, you know, we, when, when constituents would write in to ask a question, sometimes their questions weren't always responded to or um, conveyed in such a way that they could get, we could get answers. So, or who who was the right person to get those answers from was always critical as well. So being a board member who who was approachable, um, I could then go to the right person within the state board community, um, the personnel, and ask specific, more specific questions than just to other board members. So that's so that's one, and and so I could get you the answer quicker. Um, and that's one advantage uh, to being a board is to being a board member. Um, I remember um, several times going to higher ed uh, personnel and asking specifically about, um, uh, forgive me, I forget the word, um, remedial classes, you know, what was the percentage or um, and they said, well, I can, I'll go and specifically look for those answers for you. And they would come back directly to me with those answers. So they wouldn't have to take time on the board. So having, having that uh, advantage was, was greatly welcomed and 
I, I, I was able to then ask the appropriate questions next on how we could stop the, um, the remediation, what was needed at, in K-12 to, to mediate that exponential growth that was happening um, at higher ed. So th that's, that was an example of one advantage to asking the right questions with, to the right person and getting a response. Um, uh, you know, so, and knowing, also we talked about values and principles. If you don't know, um, if you don't have a foundation of why you're there, why, why are you there? Why are you doing this? Why are you, it, okay, it's just for kids, that's great, but, but why for kids? Why not for the country? Why not for your state? If you don't know what those are, um, you know, it, you'll just be doing whack-a-mole on the issues. And so, and it gets exhausting. So to have a foundation of, this is about individual freedom. This is about longevity of, a, of, of, of education in general, um, the, um, the privilege of education. Um, this is about, um, you know, establishing a republic, reestablishing a republic and what that means. You know, um, if you don't have no those values and principles that sustain you, then I think, you know, you, either your, your fuse will go out faster, if you know what I mean. Um, so I would encourage you to really look at you, why you're doing this. Um, what is it you're fighting for to continue to pass down? I know when my children approached me, mom, why are you doing this? And I said, it's because I want to show you how to do it. This was because I knew that they're going to have to fight. And um, they're going to have to fight for, yeah, Brady says the quality, you know, what is, what, what kind of quality are we looking for? I know that um, when we first started Common Core fighting back in 2010, that's when I started, um, you know, we looked at the standard writers that wrote the standards and they were all saying this is going to set kids back two years. Well, now we're seeing across the country kids that can't read past their grade at 50% levels on, in every state. I mean, it's appalling. We have, I, I met with the CEO of Math, Mathnasium in Utah, and he said he would never hire a, a child from public school because their math skills were so poor. Um, you know, so the quality is definitely lacking. Um, I know that um, Utah and several other states are looking at social study standards. Um, Pioneer um, uh, uh, Institute, was it Pioneer? Um, out of Boston, Oak. Yeah, Pioneer. Um, Pioneer just um, just released their grading uh, of all the social studies curriculum that are out there. Take a look at that. Um, find out what was the best, what was the least. Um, you know, was it the 1619 project, which was an F, which we all agree with, um, would be an F. Um, versus the 1776 project could have been an A, you know, just take a look and, and see what the best is for the state of Utah for your, uh, you know, um, I would encourage the same here for, t for Texas. Um, so know, know what you're fighting for and, and align the, the principles and the values and, and the, um, and, and each issue along with those principles and you won't have a problem. Thanks, Lisa. Um, Jenny, do you have anything you want to add to that or do you want to move on to another one? Yeah, I just have two comments to add to that. Um, most decisions in a board meeting are made before the board meeting starts. And I think it's important for board members and public to know that because the key thing is to do the research, the information and to provide the best insight you can as a board member. And the other thing is, um, ah, where's my notes here? Um, the, the boards are representative of the people, not necessarily staff or um, um, what the superintendent, it's the other way around that the superintendent works for the boards. And so I just think that's a key thing that I, I think people need to keep in mind. Okay. I, I'm just going to add one thing to that before we jump to Wendy. When I first got involved in education issues um, back uh, 2004, 2005 timeframe, um, David Cox uh, was a, a teacher here in our district, and he was also, uh, for a time, a state representative. And he accompanied me to our district one time. And as we left um, a particular meeting, he said, "The role of a super, the, the first job of a superintendent is 
at a uh, school district is to get the board in their back pocket. And mm -hmm. he said, he said that because in essence, what they're trying to do is the board hires the superintendent, the superintendent wants to please the board, but he also wants to be in charge of his little fiefdom, his district. And so uh, be aware that you're get you know, as a board member, you're going to get schmoozed by district personnel. That's my word. You're going to get um, approached by them like, oh, you know, I'm just trying to help you. And, and I'll let the board members speak to this more, but I, I totally saw this in, in the interactions within our local school district that, you know, where they could influence people uh, to a high degree, those people, the, the board members that, that were tight knit with the district personnel were the hardest to try and influence because they just, they just said, you know what, the district people are just, they're good people and they're just doing, you know, such a good job for us. And they're, you know, maybe they're, you know, a, an ecclesiastical person in the community. And so they would never do anything, you know, to hurt children. And it's like, I'm sure they wouldn't, you know, intentionally try and hurt children. But I can tell you that their policies that they, they might be promoting and stuff could be causing massive long-term damage as it did in our school district where they weren't teaching the times tables to tens of thousands of children. Mm -hmm. So to, to Oak's point, um, ever, you know, you talk about fiefdom, there's um, every group has their own little um, club. So the superintendents have their own little club and all the superintendents of the state will meet quarterly and they'll talk about the issues and then they'll go out of state and be trained, um, uh, you know, on how to be a, a superintendent. Um, the state superintendent, she goes and does her own um, own uh, meetings. Um, she, I know she belongs to West Ed, right, where um, the superintendents or the president, some are appointed, some are hired by the governor. <clears throat> Not all of them are elected. Um, you know, they'll go to West Ed and she'll talk about the topics of West Ed or, you know, th that are coming in from the Department of Education, and she'll bring those ideas back into to the meetings, you know, and vice versa with the, with the um, staff, you know, the staff will go and visit with other staff around this around the country, and they'll bring in their own ideas, and they'll try to, to write them into policy or to, um, to discuss them and make them part of the conversation. Um, I know on the state board, there was a book called Group Think um, that, that they bought 10 books and it just circulated around the office. And now everybody was having a group think discussion, you know, and then somehow that got into um, discussions within the board. Right. So, it, you know, and I even took a copy home and read some of it, you know, and, and if you know anything about group think, it's more of along the lines of, of communism let's all think together there's nobody on the outside you know like there's there's no individual thinking um and and that's and that's very influential to your staff and how how it directs into policy so so be aware of of the of the environment and and the quality um i think one of the things here is um getting along with board members um you know let's let's hold off on that until we get to that a little bit later okay i I just want to make one comment and then go to Wendy and get her take on the district. Something that you just said, Lisa, um, triggered this memory. I had um, at least uh, one informant in both our local district and at the state office of education. And both of them informed me just how subversive uh, personnel were, how intentional they were at mm -hmm. uh, working around board members. Uh, mm -hmm. One story in particular was um, some some vehicle uh, shenanigans that were going on in our local district here, and um, they would basically uh, people could check out a vehicle and use it, and they they just through the the buddy network, um, you know, use those for personal 
uh, use. And mm -hmm. they would uh, play games with board members. A board member would say, hey, I want to come out and visit the school tomorrow. Next day, the person that would be their main contact at the school would mysteriously be sick and couldn't uh, visit with them and, and take them around. And so um, there are games that people will play uh, within districts or, or the state office to uh, intentionally try and sabotage your ability as a public servant to uh, see what's going on. And you, you just need to be aware of that and, and do what you can to um, uh, well, work around that. Oh, so, can I just say something real quick on that? I just, yep. um, I, I think people do, um, what they hear is what they're going to think and what they're going to engage in. And if they're going to national dialogue, they're going to engage in the national dialogue. And that's, I'm not trying to be critical of people, but that, that is something to be aware of. You do represent your local community, not a national community. And, um, and as a board member, as a state board member, I represent both educators and parents and electricians and plumbers. And do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it is a broad array of people and just being very aware that keeping that dialogue more localized does benefit, um, does benefit the community and um, the help and being able to help them engage in what is the best capacity instead of carrying on a national um, language or, or such, because often those can get sidetracked. So, and I don't know, maybe that kind of slides us into the next part a little bit, perhaps. Let get, let's get Wendy's take oh, sure. here on, on her, uh, you know, Wendy, just a little, I know you're uh, driving and can't see this, but the, the point that we were just talking about is the critical role of, bo of board members. And so right. just a little bit about your experience and how you uh, kind of view that. Well, I'd like to ditto what Jenny said. It is really important to be in contact with the people that you represent. Um, and so I would, I would actually recommend having as many town halls and, and getting feedback from the people that you represent as possible, because it is, you know, there, there is an organization national and state for every aspect of the, 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 the school district. And, and so those, and they exist in order to, to influence people. And so as a board member, your job really is to represent the people. And, and, and like Jenny said, everybody, including the teachers, the plumbers, the electricians. And, and, and one of the things that you do that I didn't realize is that if a constituent of mine has an issue with the school district, then I'm their advocate. And so mm -hmm. I, as, as their representative, and, and, and this is true at all levels of government, um, if you have a problem with the federal government, you're supposed to call your member of Congress and they advocate for you on behalf of, you know, of, of you as the representative. And that's true with you as a, as a board member. When one of your constituents has an issue with the district or the state board, they're going to contact you to advocate for them and to, you know, and, and that, that's as it should be. Um, it is important to have a, you know, an understanding of what those principles are that you're going to be espousing and look at everything from that perspective. So for me, one of the big issues was the, the parental involvement in education. And so everything that I looked at came from the perspective of, does this help parents have greater involvement in their children's education and greater oversight? And if it did, then good. And if it didn't, then that would be something that I would oppose. And uh, just again, to, to second what has been said before, when you get to the formal board meeting, most of those decisions are made beforehand, not, not through any sort of subversive sort of thing, but just because you've been looking at the information. And so it is important to give people that information in advance so that they can take the time. You wouldn't want somebody to actually just sit there and hear a comment and go, oh, I just changed my mind without having done their due diligence and researching all of that. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the way that it is and to be aware of that. But, but the board member is and needs to remember that they are the representative of every single person that, that is in their area. Thank you, Wendy. And 
And just to um, talk about, just jump off Wendy, not every constituent will be in, in, within your district. There, I know that there were some constituents that, you know, were in a more liberal district and their representative wasn't responding to them or wasn't reaching out back, you know, or, um, you know, just hearing their voice. And so they would reach out to me or one of the other board members that would. Um, so you'll be getting from all over, all over the, um, all over the state. Yeah. And, and Lisa, I, I contacted you, uh, on, uh, more than one occasion because, um, you know, my board member didn't want to hear from me and that, that happens mm -hmm. all the time. Um, you know, it, whether at the, the local district or the, the state level, if somebody knows your principal, um, they're going to want to turn to you and say, hey, can you help? Because my board member is not, you know, they're just a rubber stamp for the district or the state mm -hmm. office. Well, it's also yeah. why you have a board because you want to have a, a diversity of viewpoints and experiences. And that, that gives it validity. If you didn't need a diversity of experience and viewpoint, then you just have a single individual. I would, I would agree with what's being said there. I was contacted by someone down in Nebel School District, which I don't, rec which I don't represent per se um, last week, but because they knew that I could get the resources and knew the resources to contact, um, I was able to put them in contact with several people to answer the question that they, that they had. And that was just because a constituent of theirs knew me. And so they reached out to me. Um, I, I do always encourage people to reach out to their actual board members, though. I think they need to be aware of any concerns or any items in there, you know, that are going on. And if and, I could just make, I, I'm sorry, Jenny, um, are you, are you finished? Did you finish your thought? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and Aaron, Aaron pointed out about teachers. What about teachers? Well, I had a full district reach out to me. I had Canyon school district reach out to me because their representative wasn't listening about turnaround laws and the turnaround schools, um, issues that they were facing so you know be willing and open to talk to anybody go to their meetings even if they don't like you go to their meetings and and, and be genuinely concerned and genuinely listen um and you will find common ground on something and so when canyons reached out to me um i was quite pleasantly surprised that they would trust me enough that i could sit there and listen to their concerns and they they admittedly said, well, I, I'm shocked that we're reaching out to you, too, but you're the only one that's listening. So, you know, be that person just to be able to cross that bridge. Thanks, Lisa and Jenny and Wendy for those thoughts. Um, we've got a few uh, questions that have come in, but I feel like uh, most of these are going to relate to stuff we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Again, if you have a question, um, put it in the Q&A area. The, the chat is kind of for you guys and it, it rolls faster. So if you have an actual question, uh, put it in the Q&A and then we'll get to it. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this next section. We've talked a little about it. Um, I, I'll just mention, you know, when you go into a situation where you're going to be elected, you're going to have to run an, a campaign and that campaign is going to share your principles. You've got to know what those are. And, uh, you know, this tonight is not really the place to um, try and explain some of the issues because that's something you're going to have to do some homework on if you haven't uh, done that already. And we, we can point you to a lot of resources that would help with that. We, I'm sure we could even do a, an additional training with e either some of these board members or others that would help to teach you about some of the things you're looking at on your screen right now, like CRT, which is critical race theory. That's a, a very hot topic right now across the country. SEL, so, socio, so, who? social emotional learning. Thank you. I was like, socio, <laughs> socio, which is the same thing. Yes. Same <laughs> yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Just these are buzzwords, equity, inclusivity, mm -hmm. and diversity. Uh, this stuff, what it what it says is not what it means. And so, um, you know, these are all issues that we've all been battling for a long time. And we're just not going to get into them individually tonight. There's just not time. But you will need to understand what these issues are and be able to dig in and recognize when somebody presents to you 
something like like this last one, constructivism. That's perhaps the the least uh, recognizable on this list. That's how I got started 20 years ago when I found out that constructivism meant kids construct their own knowledge instead of having a teacher actually tell them how something works. The kids should just essentially struggle with it for a while and a good long while. And the, the thing is, is like once you become aware of the issues, you're going to see the same issues over and over again. It becomes a what we call a fad, an education fad. So when they fail and parents um, rise up and put an end to one particular fad, like constructivism, where they're not teaching the times tables, uh, they'll rename something and rebrand it. Like Common Core has been renamed and rebranded even here in Utah. Now they call it Utah Core. And, the, and I had a lady, we, we did a, a rally a few months ago for one of our board members up at the Capitol. And a lady came up to me and said, I've worked for five governors in Utah and we're not on Common Core. And I said, really? You, you actually believe that? You know, and this was right in front of the state office of education. And I said, do you know who I am? Like, I run the, the website, Utahns Against Common Core. I've compared them. I know what Utah Core and Common Core say, and it is 99.9% .9 word for word. You know, yeah. and as soon as she realized that she was talking to someone that knew what he was talking about, she said, I've got to go to a meeting and left. And she walked about six feet to somebody else to see if she could fool them. And so you've got to know what's going on. And then once you do, you're going to, you're going to see these things repeated and people are going to say, oh, you know, well, this is the latest thing. This is the latest research shows this and it's utter nonsense, a lot of it. And so you just have to get familiar with the issues and then understand your principles. Local control is essentially parental rights. Lo lo the ultimate local control is parent control. And so that's that's where we should be uh, moving toward. Wendy said something about that a minute ago. We, I mean, we, we keep taking, stripping away parents' rights and their ability to influence their children's education. And Utah state law gives parents what's called a fundamental liberty interest in the education of their children. And so, uh, you know, when you understand that, when you say this is this is my rock solid foundation, you don't you just don't deviate off of that. And so with that, does anybody have anything they want to add to what I've said? I don't want to go into depth on any issues, um, but, you know, if you want to add something, that's great. Wendy. Um, I would just add one other thing that I think is going to start rearing its head up. Back in the day, it was called um, outcome-based education. It's kind of related to constructivism. Like Oak said, that has been rebranded to competency-based education. And the, the push that I'm seeing is that that's the direction that we're going. Part of the difficulty with that is we're going to lose a common language and a common understanding because we're going to slice students up into we're going to give you this piece of information and this piece of information and it's almost a behaviorist sort of model where you're going to give them that feedback and it works really well with computers where you give them the feedback and make sure you know just like rats in a maze that they hit the appropriate toggle to be allowed to go on so watch for competency-based education thanks wendy anybody else so I would say competency-based education has been, um, let me just go back to understand competency-based. You have to understand that where the term stakeholder comes from. The term st stakeholder was brought up by Klaus Schwab, who is now uh, the president of the World Economic Forum. Um, to understand what a, s a stakeholder versus um, a shareholder you know, shareholders, you know, they had interest within the company. They worked with the company. They were, they were more intimate. Stakeholders are more outside interests. And they don't have, stakeholders do not, uh, the word or the term does not include parents. And so, you know, every time we'd say, well, the stakeholders so it'd be all the business interests and all of the political interests, all of the um, philanthropy interests would 
you know, like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who have invested money in, in education policies and programs and curriculum and assessments and all of that they've got their tentacles in, they expect a return on investment. So, so the stakeholders then have, will direct uh, what the standards would be that the kids need to meet. Right. This is how Common Core came in with Achieve and the next um, the Governor's Association. Right. And um, so they invented the standards. They have put regional standards in and then the assessments to measure those standards. You know, we had no child left behind to bring in the standards, bring in the assessments, then the standards and then the curriculum. And then you have SEL, the emotional. So you have to understand why it's all happening and where it's going next. And so when you talk about algorithms, um, like Wendy talked about, um, and, um, you know, where it's going with AI, really, we've, we've got to incorporate all of this. This is not conspiracy. You've got to really follow the money of, of where this is going, where this is coming from, um, and and look into how technology, tech industry is a billion dollar industry. Um, the last number I saw was $17 billion. Um, you know, the Global Silicon Valley Summit um, with Arizona State University, really look at this stuff and how it's in, influencing um, education uh, that will benefit you to see where it's going next. Okay, I want to take two questions that uh, relate to some of this, and um, let's. I know we're uh, we're going to run uh, long tonight unless we try and really stay on target. So I'm going to ask you guys these questions. Try and keep the answers as short as possible now, um, so we can get through as many questions as we can because we still have a lot to get to. Um, Charles asks, I'm up on a lot of these terms that we see here, but how do I stay current on the latest tactics to get them into the schools? So Jenny, you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, I think for me, there's a couple of things that, um, are, are dead giveaways. And one of those is if it removes the parent, right. And someone else is replacing the parent or we're not allowing the parent to engage with some kind of transparency. It doesn't matter which one of these items it is. It's, it's easily detectable that it's, it's probably not going to be best. Well, it's not going to be best for education community because what is best for parents and children will be best for education. It's not the other way around. Um, uh, oh shoot. I was trying to think there was one other thing. I'll think about it. Okay. I, I like your answer because that's really, it really comes back to the principles. Like you just said, you know, mm -hmm. if it's not good for the parents end of story, you know, that, that is not a good program and we should be shrinking things, not uh, expanding them. And the other thing is, and this, Lisa talked just a little bit about that, but when you talk about massive data collection on individuals, that becomes very concerning for me. And so I, that is something at the state that I watch closely is who's, Who's getting the money? What kind of data are they collecting and how are they collecting it? Because once again, it's driving an outside narrative versus a localized, um, the localized needs. And so that's, those are just little things that I look for that are maybe the principles that I'm concerned about. Um, anyways, those are my thoughts. Okay. Uh, here's the next oh, question. If I could just say really quick, oh. just answer real fast. So currently I'm with No Left Turn in Education. I'm the Texas State Chapter of that, and I'm on the executive um, executive team on the national level. Um, I am in charge of, of looking at the legislative and Congress and being aware of what's happening with Global Silicon Valley, with Cong congressional efforts. Um, and uh, so that's where you're going to want to look. You're going to want to go to these these conferences to see what they're talking about. Um, whether you're running for the state board or for your local districts, go to the national com conferences and see what they're talking about. You'll know what's coming next. Sometimes you have to speak up. Sometimes you're there just to listen so you can prepare to see what's coming on your district level. Thanks, Lisa. I would just watch for buzzwords. You'll hear stuff yes. like rigorous, personalized, you know, yes. everybody knows and, 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 and new, newfangled things. And it's important to realize that the fundamental basics of education, the reading, writing, and arithmetic, the, the academics are really what we're focused on. And I read a book once that talked about the newfangled stuff isn't usually what we're trying to 
get kids to learn. I mean, the alphabet's been around for how long? Um, Euclidean geometry's been around for how long? These are the fundamental things that we're trying to teach. And we're trying to bring in newfangled, latest and greatest, then take a step back and see where, where is this going and where is it coming from? Perfect. Okay, uh, Keith is uh, pulling us back to our basics here. He says, can you briefly explain what the duties of a local school board member are and what they do? What do they control? I've always thought they represent parents and schools. I think this has been lost over time, but coming back full circle based on the political climate. So basic, what does a school board member do? Wendy, why don't you touch on the district? And then uh, Jenny, you can touch on what you do at the state right now. Okay, so the local school board um, is responsible for hiring the superintendent and the business administrator. The business administrator handles the financials, and then they are responsible for running the district. But the board creates policies um, in a similar fashion that the legislature creates laws, the board creates policies. So, for example, in Alpine School District, we created a policy that says that any parent has the right to excuse their child for any reason. So that's, you know, and that's the policy that we put in place. We are subject to state law. We are subject to state board rule. But within that framework, a local school board member and th the board as a whole is responsible for policy. Um, it, there's also oversight. We create the budget. Well, this business administrator creates the budget. Then we weigh in. We ask questions. We can modify it. Um, but we are the ones that approve the, the budget. Uh, the local school board members also um, approve bonding, uh, property purchases, where are we building the next high school, um, any property tax increases. All of those things are squarely at the feet of the local board. Um, and then again, like I mentioned earlier, uh, your job is to represent your constituents um, and help resolve any particular issues with the people that uh, you represent. Thanks, Wendy. Jenny? And at the state level, and we're doing this currently with English standards as well as um, social study standards, but we are this, we set the standards, local districts um, are the, the, they do the curriculum. Um, and however they do that, there's a variety of ways. So um, they would have a policy about how they do curriculum or um, find curriculum to be used. Um, the other things we do is we disperse the money that is, is allocated from the legislature to districts. So those could be through a variety of programs, including WPU or, um, or weighted pupil unit and grants, um, a very, various elements that we distribute the money and allocate that. Um, and we're, I was trying, there was, there's a couple other things. The advocating of um, legislation sometimes is a key thing either for or against things. Um, we take positions each, each week during the legislative session on a variety of bills. Um, it's not my fate. I don't love that part of it <laughs> because it, it's just, it's kind of messy, but maybe messy is good. But um, um, I do spend a lot of time advocating for different bill, bills in education or against different bills in education as a board member at the legislature, be, just because I have an understanding of what's going on. Um, I'm trying to think, there's some other policy, we do a lot of policy, we write rules and policy regarding bills that have been approved, so this the law. You also make the policies for teacher licensing? Yes, we do that, and we also oversee um, the, we are the the regular board for the um, School of the Deaf and the Blind in the state of Utah. That was something I was not aware of prior to getting onto the board. Um, we are their school board, their localized board, even though it's a state um, run school um, type of a thing. So yes. Okay, I'm gonna um, move us on to uh, some questions here that deal with actually items four and five. I think people have a lot of um, questions about things that they can do uh, that way. And then we'll come back to three um, on organizing a campaign. So um, Christina asks, would you say that advocacy for student rights is a Trojan horse for usurping parents' rights? Um, yes, um, there is because 
Yes, because it's coming from the top down, and I'm talking outside of the United States. Uh, the United Nations has has a children's rights um, memorandum that they're that they're pushing uh, for all uh, nations to adopt. I know that soft law has picked up that right. Um, children should not have rights because now they're talking about consent lowering the age of consent for sex, um, giving, um, I know here in Texas, we're talking about gender transformation without parental consent. Um, you know, ch children have a right. Um, it, it's all under the N uh, LGBTQ guys that's being pushed into schools right now. Um, so yeah, children's rights is, it's, I would not be pushing for that at all. Yeah. And um, I think, Right along when, I, when I referred to advocacy, it wasn't for children's rights. I was refer, and that this is me. <laughs> I, I can't speak for other people, but um, advoc advocacy meaning um, correct resources, um, advocacy for I, I'm an advocate advocate for simplicity um, instead of complicating things. Advocate for less um, state um, influence in local districts. Those kind of things is what I was referring to by advocacy. Yeah. for me. And I just want to add, like, um, you know, and I don't know the exact nature of the the question and everything that is in Christina's mind as she's asking that, but I just want to say one of the things that I like to see um, in in school choice, and I say that in a in a very broad sense, like when parents make decisions about schools, is we shouldn't be shutting down a school that we might disagree with philosophically in some way. Um, for example, there's, there's a school in Lehigh that uh, is run by somebody I know, and it is very much a student choice kind of education. Who's to say that's not right for the kids that go there, that, that want to have more freedom and say over what they're learning? And so, uh, you know, whatever the opportunities are, if somebody wants to create a private school or, or you know, do something different, I mean, uh, realistically, or or um, originally, charter schools were supposed to be incubators of different ideas, and instead, they have just morphed into a a, a pseudo public school where it looks like you've got more autonomy and freedom, and maybe have a smidgen, but they are still under all the state regulations and stuff, and that's not how they were supposed to be in the beginning. But the state always finds a way to slide in their oversight. Everybody wants their oversight when really it should be the parents at that school providing, hey, what are we most interested in? What, you know, th that's where local control really comes in is when the parents of the kids at that school can say, you know what, we want this curriculum. We want these standards. We want um, this type of assessment. And we don't care what the state or nation or the world is doing. We just want to know that our kids are being educated in a way that we approve of here locally. But that doesn't really exist anymore, except in like private schools and homeschools. And right. there is a bill currently, <laughs> Senate Bill 191, that advocates for that um, innovative practices. So it, it'll be interesting to see if, if it makes it through the House anyways. It, it may it is supposed to loosen some of those requirements. We'll see if that actually happens. So the, one of the things that um, I've, I've always believed in, I've, I'm more of an advocate of parent choice, not school choice. Uh, I just always caution, you know, of, of funding following the student and having mandates and accountability measures put on the student or the parent to ensure uh, that those funds are being spent appropriately. I mean, I was in a conversation on law and licensing when I was on the board where I was literally told that I could follow the money all the way down to the parent, to the mom who was teaching piano lessons um, across the street for a student to ensure that that mom, that mom was licensed to be a piano teacher, that she had gone through whatever class. I mean, that was just more intrusion that I was willing to, that I don't advocate for. I don't think this, I don't think the state has that authority. Um, so we need to really, really be careful. The state obviously does think they have that authority to follow the money all the way down as far as you want to, technically they want to. Um, so be very careful with charter schools. Um, I know there was one school in my district 
who um, had to submit to the state assessment. And so they were in turnaround for three years and they were on the verge of losing their school and they were struggling, but yet all of their kids were passing the ACTs and the end, um, but failing the state assessment. And so there was no reconciliation there and, it, and they still struggle. I don't even know if they um, are open or if they're still struggling. Um, I did try to bring in the, the classic uh, learning test and I was told as, a, as another form of assessment at the end of the year, and I was told it violated um, the establishment clause by our state, assigned, state board assigned attorney general uh, there. And, and I, so I argued with him. But I mean, that's something to pursue, to say, can we bring in outside assessments to, to um, ensure that our kids are learning what, they're, what they need to know? Yeah. Okay. Uh just super quick about how much time does a school board member spend per month on board business? You break it up, you know, <laughs> per week, per month. Um, you know, you've got meetings, just super quick uh, baseline answers. Wendy, what is it at a district? And Al Alpine is a, a large Alpine. Alpine is the largest district in the state. So it's not a fair, um, the, what, I, what I would say is that you have your two main, um, board meetings per month that you're obligated to. So just write off those Tuesday nights um, and then whatever amount of time, depending, usually the first board meeting is more of the business. So there's a little bit more time on that. Um, so as, as far as preparation goes, it, it can, it can vary. I would say, um, you know, it's a part-time job. So between 10 and 20 hours, but the more important thing is to set yourself some boundaries because of all of the, the people that want to influence, there's always going to be potential breakfast, meetings with this group, meeting with that group. And you want to avail yourself of as, a, of as much of that as you feel like you can, but you also need to set the boundaries of, you know, it, it's a part-time job. And so when you allow it to go further, you could allow it to take up your whole life. Um, there are that many opportunities. So don't, don't let it. Thanks, Wendy. How about at the state? I, <laughs> I, I, I talked with someone this morning and answered this question for them, but if you're asking me how much time I spend, that's going to be different than other people. Um, this is almost a full-time job for me, but it's not a, literally a full-time job, but I, I do um, engage in this every day um, in some capacity. Um, it's two board meetings, a month, two days a month for the board meeting. It's usually a Friday, Saturday, I mean, sorry, Thursday, Friday at the first week of the month. It's their full day meetings. Um, then there's often during the legislative session, we have a two hour meeting once a week um, where we, we kind of catch up on legislation and different things going on. Um, and then if you're on a committee, you might be on the, the assessment and accountability committee. And those meet usually um, quarterly, uh, sometimes a little bit more frequently. Um, but I do spend quite a bit of time engaging with, um, you know, either researching. I do a lot of research. I do a lot of reading of bills, a lot of reading of laws, um, policies, that kind of a thing. So, it, you know, if you've got other advocates on your on the board, the work can be divided up easier. Whereas if you don't, then it, it feels like you're carrying a little bigger load. But um, Anyways, I, I, I mean, I think you do have to create a balance to that, but also be able to um, meet the needs that you you feel impressed need to be met. So, okay, Jenny, in in conjunction with that, someone asked a question here uh, that kind of goes along with that. Like, if when it get comes to like how much time you have to spend on an issue, kind of depends on your allies. So, somebody asked. Well, allies within a board sounds great, but what about allies in other groups? And they specifically said like UEA, teachers unions, et cetera. And um, yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the, I mean, I, I don't know, this is just Jenny Earl's tactic, but I do believe in building relationships. I, I try to really try to build relationships of trust and respect um, when I work with people so that I can you know, I, I feel like I can call them and engage with them. And, and that's another thing. I don't have to spend all my time deep researching stuff. There's some things if I have a question on, I can call Wendy Hart 
or I can call, do you know what I'm saying? I can call someone I know that already knows it. Um, and I have a friend that knows the data, data research end of it inside and out. I can call her and, you know, she already knows the answer. I don't have to do the deep dive. So just building relationships with people, not just on the board, but outside of it. So you can engage in a way that is most productive and efficient with your time, quite honestly. Um, did that answer your question? <laughs> Can, can I throw something out in there? Yes, um, yeah. The other thing that is interesting is we tend to see things in a tribal manner. Um, and what I found being on the board is it's very interesting how often you can find that common ground. Um, and you may, you may have that common ground for different reasons, but just because the UEA is opposed to something may not mean that it's a bad thing. It may actually be something that you want to be opposed to. Um, we, we had common ground on our board for very different reasons in opposing tying teacher pay to the state assessments. And there was, there was broad support for that for many different reasons, and it didn't follow those ideological lines. So be careful to not just brand people as one side or the other as well, because you may be able to find that there is common ground. Yeah, that's great. Can I add one more thing to that real quick? Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is sometimes... Um, I think maybe staff or other individuals, we, we kind of categorize them. Oh, they're just pushing this or that. It may be that they've never considered something else, quite honestly. It may be that they're not trying to push something, but they've never considered another or a, an alternate idea. And so I do spend a lot of time engaging in dialogue with people um, with, with, from various viewpoints so that um, we can create more of a, a common understanding or they can understand where I'm coming from. Too, so that there's more openness when we move forward on policies. Um, we're not fighting one another, but we're understanding where our differences are. That's a great point, Jenny. Thank you. And, and I've seen that too, where, uh, you know, I, I could be easily accused of not understanding the other side's viewpoint, but uh, at the same time, I, I could easily accuse them of, of not seeing the, uh, the viewpoints I have. So it, that dialogue is important. And that kind of gets to the fourth bullet point here, getting along with board members while you maintain your principles. And I think you spoke a little about that. Lisa, do you have anything you want to add about that? Um, you, you know, I think you get to know your board members on trips um, or, you know, at lunches um, or traveling to an event. Um, the small talk is how you get to know your board members. But at the same time, you know, as much as I had great conversations with a certain board member, uh, the minute I spoke up and said that I was leaving, she applauded and <laughs> um, was not as um, friendly at that point as I have experienced her in other times. Um, so get to know them. I mean, they're people. We're all people. We're human. We're all, you know, we, we're all concerned about the students. I think that's probably the probably the number one commonality is we all want the students to succeed. What that looks like varies, of course, but um, to understand that, you know, they may think that what they're doing is the best interest at their, in, in their hearts, right? And vice versa. And it's just a matter of um, communicating in such a way that they can understand your point of view and you can understand theirs and then come to that commonality. And, and do it in a respectful manner. Absolutely. It, it reminds me of uh, Antonin Scalia and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Even though they were ideologically opposite, they had like what by all accounts seems like a genuine friendship uh, getting along on the Supreme Court. And um, mm -hmm. I think that's a an interesting, a great example for us uh, to, you know, do what we can to engage in that um, relationship building so that, you know, when the time comes, we can turn to somebody and say, Hey, you know, I have some real concerns and I I'd like you to listen to this and, mm -hmm. and help them see your point of view and make sure you understand where they're coming from. Uh, can I jump in? Jefferson yeah. said that he never lets politics interfere in his, in his friendships. And, and that that's important because just because you may disagree with someone, doesn't mean that their intention may be bad. And, and in politics, we're kind of drawn into that idea that there's, you know, there's no way that this person could be a good person if they see it this way. And the reality is most people that you meet 
like was said, they care about kids, they want positive educational experiences, and they just see it differently. So if you approach people from a position of, of they're, they're a good person who cares about kids and an and, and openness to listen, um, you'll, you'll make good strides. And even if you completely disagree, um, you can still be friends and you should be because the, you know, they're, they're sacrificing their time and energy as well. Yeah. Thanks, Wendy. Um, okay. Who, here's a, a question from somebody. Um, Kirsten asks, who enforces the policies made by the school board? The superintendent is, is responsible, um, kind of, you know, he's the executive or she, it's like the legislature passes laws, the governor signs them, but then it's the executive branch that's responsible for making sure that they're executed. The, the recourse on the school board, if the superintendent doesn't execute those, those policies is to come back and sit down and say, hey, we need to have this done. The ultimate, um, you know, is to not reappoint the, the superintendent or to let him go. Um, and so again, it's an employee employer relationship and the board is the employer of the superintendent business administrator. And they're the ones that, that are supposed to execute those policies. So at the state level, when the legislature makes laws, the state is responsible to incorporate those laws or that law language into policy and rulemaking. So then that trickles down to the district. And there are a few checks and balances in there. Um, one of those is if we, and at the state board level, a rule that doesn't align with law, the rules committee can actually ask for that to be brought before them. Um, so there are, there are checks and balances that way. If you're talking a local district, um, you know, it, it just good policy makes for good enforcement, so to speak. Um, just making sure your policies are really what you want them to be, because if they're not, then you can't, they're not really enforceable. Um, hopefully that answered the question. I'm not sure if that's where the person was heading, but. Okay. Um, Kim asks, so if I have a full-time job already, it sounds like this may be pretty difficult to fit in. Do people quit their jobs to run for school board? Now, let me just mention, you know, it depends. Like Jenny said, um, she spends a lot of time on this and, you know, depending on uh, what you are facing, you know, at the state level, or if you're in a, a local district, it's going to differ. I know uh, a few years back, Joel Wright, uh, who is an attorney, ran for uh, state school board and got on from my area. And he had a full, very full-time job as an attorney and, you know, he, he still tried to squeeze it in and maybe, you know, maybe he f didn't always feel like he was as prepared as he would like to be, but, you know, he, he still served and tried to do the best he could under those circumstances. So I think most, most people on the state board do have a full-time job. Uh, two attorneys, do we have three? Two attorneys, at least at several that teach and uh, several that are administrators. Uh, Mark Huntsman, who's the chair actually runs, he's the owner of a large organization um so yeah i i think um you know there's there's just different situations and you you can make it work with whatever you have so and what's the stipend for a, a board member or the pay uh within a district or the state i heard that alpine just raised theirs um when i was on the board it was 500 a month but there were additional you know travel um, when you go to conferences, they cover all that. And then there was an additional amount that we would get. I'd have to go back and look at it. Um, yeah, 12000 a year is the standard. That's that's the... Um, so anyway, it, it, it varies. And uh, about half of the people that I worked with um, on, on the local school board uh, were, were full-time employed. Um, I had a two-year-old when I ran, and I had a full-time job from home but um it, it again it's it's the amount of time you you can schedule it that that's that's it the, the state is um the same as the legislators for a day so it's it's not all things some things are volunteer for meaning that you're put on a committee that's volunteer there are some that are paid so it just depends i would guess anywhere from maybe 1200 to 
1500 a year. I don't know, maybe Lisa can, it's a, it's about that. It's not. I, know, mine was much less. I, I, I barely made 9,000 a year when I was on the board. Um, but again, it's, um, you know, they do pay for the travel if you travel out of state or to a conference that, that you want to go to. Some were voluntaries. Um, well, I think they're all voluntary if you want to go. Um, but, you know, go to the NASB ones. Go to the ones that nobody wants to go to. I went to a digital um, a conference one and I cannot, I mean, I signed a memorandum of agreement that I wouldn't share half of the stuff I learned. But I can tell you I'm in shock and awe that um uh, how blatantly willing they are and to circumvent parental rights you know just things um you know and they didn't the, the discussions we had i i was i could not believe some of these people were, were in office um because they didn't know the basics of the constitution so um you know just uh, set time aside you know get to know people who know the issues already can give you a cliff notes version if, if you need to have the cliff notes but really it's about the foundation if you have the foundation then you pretty much you know if it aligns with parental rights parent parents first in every single issue then those decisions and decisions should be easily makeable um if that's a word um so just just put that down first and then the others will you'll get the others pretty quickly okay thank you um, okay, let's talk just, I don't know how much, how important it is to talk about the opposition outside the board. Was that a big issue for any of you? Has that been a, a big issue? It depended on the issue, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, on local school boards, you change school boundaries, there's huge opposition. Um, uh, if you espouse a particular position, you're, you're, you're getting it you know, you're going to get opposition. Again, I would say the same thing. Um, assume that people are coming from a place of, of good intent. Uh, and, and the difficulty of being a board member is that our natural incl inclination as people is that if someone makes a personal attack that you, you want to fight back. And I, I would say the best case scenario is to not. Um, sometimes it's best to not, to, yeah, and certainly on social media, um, yeah, just, just let it go. Just let it go. Um, if there's, if there's a substantive issue, if there's fact-based information you need to share, feel free to share it. Um, but you do have to get to water off a duck's back. Uh, you're in the public eye. Uh, you know, that that's how it's going to be. I got criticized for opting my kids out of the state tests. It's being completely unsupportive of teachers. Um, and I had two principals come to my defense in that very same meeting to say, yeah, but Wendy's role is as a mother first and as an elected representative of this district second. And I think that was because I was able to cultivate those relationships and they were willing to stand behind me. And they realized ultimately that that was the correct priority. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I know I've been uh, called a few names myself without being on a board. So uh, from from board members and uh, teachers. So um, you never know so where it's going to come from. Yeah. My experience was a little bit more aggressive. Um, so of course I had been in the limelight for a long time. I'd done town halls all over the state of Utah. So people knew who I was um, the, prior to running for the state school board. Um, uh, when I got onto the board, my kids' school uh, had been put in the paper. Um, the media was always, um, I was always, it always seemed to be uh, number one discussion whenever um, the board met um, on any particular topic. Um, it, it got especially heavy in 2018 um, with KUT, uh, KUTV News, Chris Jones, um, and uh, thanks to Aaron uh, Bullen, we found out that there was a sort of uh, coordinated effort to get me to resign or get me off the board. Um, it, it, so um, it's there. There will be opposition. Um, how you handle it is going to be very different. Some, you know, you can take Wendy's advice and and just ignore it. Um, I'm not that type of person. I I engage more. Um, and, um, 
learned quite a bit and uh, also was very pleased um, at the amount of support that I actually had throughout the whole state of Utah that um, made the experience whole worthwhile. You know, I, people in Utah are, are tremendous and they will come and rally to your aid um, and support you in the cause. And I think that's, um, I think it great outpouring of love. And that's when you know as a board member why you're there. And as a, as a spiritual board member, you know, to, to love another person is to see the face of God. And you're doing this out of the love of the kids. I don't know how anybody else would put themselves in a position to fight against these policies that, that want to take parental rights away, take, you know, separate families, um, distort history, destroy your country and, and, take children's futures away. I just don't know how you do that without um, developing a love for the kids that you're fighting for. And um, so be prepared of, of how you're going to respond. Um, I was more proactive. I, <laughs> I kind of, um, it happened during the year that President Trump was being attacked uh, nonstop on media. So I kind of followed in his footsteps and preempted and uh, struck first on, on the story that, that KUTV wanted to present and that did not make them happy. Um, so game on and <laughs> I'm a fighter and, and I'll, and I'll fight back. And um, uh, so, but anyways, it, 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 it's up to you. Hold your integrity high. Um, that was what I have. That's all I have is my integrity. And so I'll fight for it. Thanks Lisa. So I, I'll just toss one thing in. Uh, there's a couple of comments about, you know, like, uh, what do you do if, you know, you and somebody else have conflicting issues or uh, things of that nature? And I, I'll just say, you know, just toss in a soft answer turneth away wrath. You know, we're in an, an age where everything is escalating. And, uh, you know, one of my concerns is when people are out on the street and somebody confronts somebody, things can get out of control faster than ever before. And so, uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in taking the silent approach, like, look, you know, this is my position, you know, happy to talk about it, but I would not encourage anybody to, you know, raise their voice, get uh, defensive, you know, deal with things in as calm a manner as possible, because ultimately you get one thing, which is a vote. And, you know, when you're one of five or seven or 15 people on a board, you have enormous representation power to affect things. And, you know, you should be listening to people, but you should also, you know, um, not, not let somebody get the, the best of you because you also don't know when there's a gotcha going on. And, um, you know, you, you could have media or somebody just waiting with a camera to catch you doing something. I've seen that happen before to someone and they didn't know, you know, that what they were doing was going to be splashed everywhere. And so be be careful about what you say and do. Do be careful. Yeah, I I, yeah let, let's, I do want to accelerate things here and make sure we get to the campaign stuff. Go ahead, Wendy. Um, the, the formality of the board meetings with Robert's rules is actually designed to de-escalate things like that. So you, you're not supposed to direct your comments directly to another board member it's always referred to as the chair and i didn't realize that going into it and so the more that you can follow that level of decorum it actually helps to de-escalate things and have everybody's voices heard but i would also say really quickly a board member may have only one vote but they can also influence the public um, with their answers or with their discussions um, and and help them to change their mind and then they can trickle down and, and meet 10 other people. So I, I think uh, board members especially have more than just a vote. They have a voice that others wouldn't have and they can hear our answers. Um, and that helps them and helps the public then to come back and support the board member in the boardroom. So there's a vital relationship there that needs to be acknowledged. Okay, thank you. Um, let's get then to uh, the campaign stuff. There, there are a few questions here about that. I know people are really eager um, cause that seems like that's like, oh, I've, you know, got a file 
in another week. Um, next week is the deadline for Utah. It's the uh, registration week. Um, and then uh, it's, you know, get, get your campaign going uh, time. And so um, just real quick, uh, there's a question, where do you file? So where are you going to file if it's for the state or for a district? I think I just filed with my local clerk. I think you can just file. I, I don't think that's changed at all. I think whether you're a state person or not, um, but I would, it takes a little bit to fill out the paperwork. So don't wait till the last day to do it. It's not like you can race in and just sign your name to something. You have to put out um, your conflict of interest paper and a, you know, a little bit of an information. So pull it up and get it filled out ahead of time and then take it in. So. Perfect. So just County, County clerk's office. That's where I filed before. I don't think that's changed. Yeah. So I, I think, I, I think it's the same and local is the County clerk's office as well. The only thing I don't know is if you have a, a city school district, like Provo school district, I don't know if you file with the, the city. Um, but you might be able to file with both the city and the, the, and the county clerk. You can just call them and they'll know and they'll tell you. Yeah, just make a phone call tomorrow if you have a question about that. Now, there's uh, Brady here asks a question. Um, how does one file their campaign with the Department of Commerce? He has uh, an EIN. So he's, it look, sounds like he has actually, is actually going to the step of creating um, a, uh, an incorporated entity of sorts to maybe handle uh the campaign did any of you do that did you no but i do know there are uh, i spoke with david kyle who said that there's a benefit to that if you're doing like robo calls and some other things and i don't i'm not sure i understand the ins and outs of that particularly but um that was recommendation he had um but limited liability protection, maybe. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, not sure. sure. I think it, it created an access to resources that aren't there just to run otherwise that you needed okay. the EIN number for that. Okay. Um, all right. The, can I throw in, uh, I know on the state level, I believe, um, you, Jenny will have to tell me if this is the case, that you do want to file, um, have a separate bank account for campaign you donations. You have to. You have yes. to have one. Uh, on the state yes. level, you do on like in Alpine on the local level, uh, you don't have to set up a separate bank account, although it would be wise to do that. But you do have to keep very, very close records of the monies that you get in and the monies that you expend. And if you do not, and, and the, the county clerk will tell you what the, what the deadlines for, for your financial filings are and how to go about doing that. And when I was running the, the clerk's office was really good about emailing. You've got this much time before you have to do the financial disclosures. If you do not submit your financial disclosures on time, you are eliminated from the ballot. So you could win first place. If you didn't submit your financial disclosures, you don't get, you don't get the office. And I would always recommend you kept those separate. Just it, it just is messy. If someone had to come back and audit it, they'd be going through all your finances and stuff. So Okay, so when once you filed and you're now organizing your campaign, um, did did you have a campaign manager? Did you um, set up social media channels? What did you do to advertise, get the word out, yard signs, uh, things of that nature? Let's just try and keep it as quick as possible, and we'll take more questions. So I had yard signs. I had town hall meetings. I did cottage meetings. I went. Even though it was a nonpartisan race, I did go to some uh, party meetings so they could meet me, um, meet the delegates and things like that. Um, I, did, uh, I did Facebook live posts all the time, um, you know, where people could ask me questions. I did a few Facebook ads. Um, you can um, set it up so it's meant for a specific um, uh, data points, whether it be mom, stay at home moms or dads or, you know, age range or um, um, zip codes and things like that. So you, you could be very targeted in your advertising. And so um, a lot of that um, is what I did. You have to know if you have a Facebook page for your campaign, you have to actually apply um, through Facebook to get um, 
become a political entity. That sometimes takes a few weeks. So if, if it's something you want to get on sooner than later, you have to get approval for that through Facebook in order to be a political entity. And I'm trying to remember because it's been almost four years, but um, maybe their process is a little different now. But uh, that is, I just remember that was a key thing. I had to try to get that done so I could mass message out, you know, and move things out. So mm -hmm. I didn't know that. That's helpful to know. It's a new thing from when I read. Yeah. <laughs> so for, I, for the book, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say it was really quick for me because it was new, but go ahead, Mindy. Yeah. So from um, from a local board perspective, and I think it's important to understand that state board is a partisan race now. And so um, you either you'll, you'll probably want to go through the caucus convention system because you'll have the greatest amount of of interaction with delegates and ultimately the greatest support. And what I do like about the, the state board going partisan is that it does give that ability to send your message out to more people. Um, because otherwise, like for a local school board race, there aren't organizations other than the local teachers association that are going to probably sponsor and support you. And, um, but I would recommend that, um, that when the teachers association calls you and says, we want to do an interview, go have the conversation, um, build those bridges. So, um, Anyway, I, I would just simply say, yeah, I, I did signs, I did town halls, I did Facebook, I had a blog, uh, you know, put, put the information out there to, uh, to everybody and, um, and, and get that information out there. But, but definitely take advantage for the state board people of the caucus convention system. Okay, a question came in um, about what if there's somebody else ideologically similar running in the same race should they should, should two people try and consolidate or both run and to me if it's if it's the state board position where it's a partisan race why not let let both run because uh in a partisan race it's going to um the delegates are going to whittle that down to to one person it's not really going to be diluted is that is that how you guys would see it yeah. yeah, and actually, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Jenny. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think it just depends on the race. It really would depend on this case, right? Um, meaning that sometimes it is a good strategy for two people that are similar minded to run. Sometimes it's a good strategy to combine together. So it really would be situational in my mind, uh, just depending on the, the whole political, you know, what else is going on, um, maybe just consulting with one another or you know, working with others to see what would be the best thing to move, you know, either the best person forward or both of you forward. Um, anyways, so I, it's it, probably more situational is what I would say. Yeah. And it, at a local level, it might be very different because then you really could split the vote a little easier and you just need to see who has fewer skeletons in their closet, I guess. So uh, my personal experience, when I ran the first time, there were five of us on the ballot one was the incumbent, and then there were the rest of us. And there was one uh, one lady that was running, and you know, I called up everybody. Where are you at? You know, we were very, very similar, and it actually worked to my advantage because we had to go through a primary anyway, where they take the top two vote getters, and so neither one of us cared which one of us got in there. And so when it was me, she just simply took her campaign apparatus and switched it from her to me. And so, and she was in, you know, the neighboring city. And so she, is, she just took all of the cottage meetings and scheduled them for me instead of for herself. And then I would show up there and she was taking my signs. And for everybody that she put a sign in their yard for the primary, she just went back and gave them my sign. So it was actually advantageous to have that because it kind of expanded the reach of, of my campaign. That's awesome. And I would also suggest, I don't know if this is passed in Utah, but I heard that they were doing rank voting. That might affect it too. So you might want to think about how rank voting uh, will affect um, who comes on top and, and discuss that. They're we not going to ranked voting okay. right now because good. we don't have time for that one. Okay, good. <laughs> um, 
Okay, yes. Uh, yeah, question. Yes, the meeting is being recorded for later access. I will, as soon as this is posted, I will send out an email to anybody that signed up for this and uh, we'll share it uh, yeah. online as well. You know, um, the other thing, there are a number of debates that are often held um, and, and there's different associations that hold debates and you can decide whether it's beneficial or not beneficial. I mean, I think that's even meeting with certain groups. If, if, it's, if you don't think it's something you want to do, then you don't have to do it, right? Um, if you think it's beneficial for you, then, you know, please, you know, go ahead and do that. There's some groups that asked me to meet with them and I didn't. And there's other groups that, you know, asked me to meet with them and I did. And so I just think you need to, I, I think this just being kind of being smart and intuitive about things. And, you know, anyways, I, I guess what I'm saying is you, you've got to kind of fill out your area and know what works best in that area. Because one, not all resources or ideas are going to work in every area. Yeah. And know that I'll you'll just... be set up. Know that you'll be set up. <laughs> Yeah. And for a local school board race where you don't have a caucus to get information out, um, if you have a primary, it, that's actually beneficial for you because it'll force you to be on your game as soon as possible. But even if you don't have a primary, don't pretend that you can wait until June or July to start campaigning. You should start campaigning now. Start having debates now. Start holding town halls now because people will be interested because it is still the election season. And, and, you know, and the debates, they can be scary, you know, but uh, good practice, just, just enjoy it. So Charles asked the question, I guess, about yard signs, just call whatever communities you're in, you call and ask, because they'll have times when you can set it up six weeks before whatever. Um, yeah, that's what you want to, if you call them, you'll, you'll be able to, um, your count, your county or city has specific rules and they're all different. So you're going to want to, if you're over several cities, you're going to want to call each of those cities and ask ahead um, of time. Here's yeah. another question. And, and this is a, a good question. How do you find out a current board member's voting record? Uh, it's, it's not like those are published in the newspaper. So how, how does that work? It's, it's very difficult unless you've been following it along, um, but there are, there are minutes, and, so, and, and there are audio recordings, and now with Zoom, they probably have video recordings of it, um, but you can go back and you can find when, you know, if there's a particular issue that you're interested in, I would go, I would go look that up. Um, the budget, budget votes are June. Uh, every year there's a budget, and that's in June if there is... Um, uh, a tax increase. Uh, it's going to be, they're going to have a truth in taxation meeting probably in August, and it will be listed as a truth in taxation meeting. And you can go and look at that. And I would uh, encourage you to listen to those, uh, to the meetings. I would also encourage you to be attending your local board meetings starting now, if you haven't been already, it helps you get current on, um, on the information that's being presented. What are the hot topic issues? Uh, follow, follow that information. And, uh, and get used to, to, to what the dialogue is, you, you may learn an awful lot of, of things that you thought were going on that are, that are different. So, Okay, I want to close with this uh, so we can get to the last couple of resources slides. Um, we've gone for about an hour and a half and we're starting to lose people. Um, and so I just want to, um, you know, there's several questions on here about what are legit things to run on? What are, what are the issues I should run on? Um, you know, and, and I know we're just not going to get to every question tonight. I apologize, but, um, you know, it, when you're running a campaign, um, people want to know what your principles are and they want to know where you stand on certain issues. And the easiest way to do that, I think, is to have a website. A uh, Facebook page doesn't really count as a website because you don't really go to a Facebook page and say, Okay, where's your list of issues? That's that's a feed of like whatever you're, you know, blogging about basically. So um, it's not hard to get a website. You can easily find that and ask somebody. Um, and you know, I, I don't know everything that's best to be, to put on there, but um, you can look at other candidates' websites and see what they're doing. A donation page, a, you know, contact me to help me page. And, and your basic core principles. 
And you want to do it, you want to share your principles in a non-confrontational way. Um, you know, I, if, if I've seen uh, fiery uh, candidates and they, they might make a little bit of buzz with uh, delegates um, because they're like, wow, this guy's, you know, or girl lady is really awesome. They're, they're so on top of these principles. But if, if you're too over the top, you're not going to get elected. You've, you've got to moderate your presentation, at least to the point where you come across as a real person, a genuine person that's not like radical. Uh, you know, and I, I say that loving radicals that are for <laughs> the Constitution. Um, you know, you, you've just got to, you've got to have the right attitude that you're talking to people and you're not out there on a soapbox, even though inside you might be on your soapbox, um, you know, and, and trying to figure out how to uh, get your, you know, get in there so you, you can make a difference. And and that's what, you know. Oak, I, I would say, I, Oak, I would say stick it to three, three talking points that you want to stick to. Always make sure you hammer those three. Um, two of mine off the top of my head, I can't remember what the third one was, was local control and parent parent rights. Yeah. Um, and, and you just always bring it back. If they try to derail you, always circle it back to those three main issues that you're presenting and, and mm -hmm. just hit it home all the time. Family first. And if you can tie, you know, the issues that you're looking at into those points, yeah. that will help reinforce for people. Because sometimes you look at a candidate and you're like, is this person a Trojan horse? Like, they're just saying this? Or does this person really mean it? And if you can say like, look, you know, here's, here's these things, but this ties right back into my, my point on parental rights. Parents have to be, you know, have the, like, Gary Thompson does a fantastic job, and I, I probably can't even quote his, somebody here is going to quote his exact phrase, parents must always be the- Parents are the experts of their children. Yeah, and, and I don't know if that's even it, but parents are like, it's something right along those lines, and, and he hammers that every chance he gets. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that about Gary, and, mm -hmm. and so if you have you know, a campaign slogan and you make it something about that, then you just hammer it every chance you get because then you become associated with that um, uh, slogan. I, I had five, um, five principles and it was the, the local control, the parental rights, the transparency and the, the, the fiscal accountability. And then there was another one and I can't remember because it's been four years. <laughs> I, I did have someone... Um, my original flyer I wrote up and I had printed off. Um, the guy looked at it and he said, well, you're not going to win. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, first of all, you have too much on here. So once again, it's those highlight, those primary things that you believe in. You don't want to just, um, you know, pick something because, um, but then you just want to be very simple, get right to the root of what you're talking about. And I'm, I'm just going to show you the front of this. Oh, I don't think you, it's not zooming in on it, but it has my, my name highlighted, a, a picture, and then what I'm running for. If you overcomplicate it, you want to send people where they can get more information, but you don't want to overcomplicate it. You want them to remember the visual um, and get it to stick out. Um, there was one. Oh, sh the other thing they said is if, the, if everybody else isn't talking about it, neither should you. And the point of that is, is your talking points should be things that people are familiar with. If you're talking about something no one's familiar with, they can't relate to it. And so therefore it's, it's not going to resonate with them. So I'm not saying you talk about just, you know, things that other people want to talk about, but you talk about the things that you're supportive of that other people are interested in as well. Does that make sense? And not side things that you are feels passionately about, you know, but no one's talking about it right now. So just being yeah. smart is what it is. I would also make sure that, it, like Oak said, have a website, have an actual website, not a Facebook page. And, and take the time to make sure that that's on the signs, it's on your brochures, it's on your whatever it is. Because what you're saying by having that website is, it's not about my name or me being in that seat. It's about representing these issues. And so it invites people into having that conversation with you. What do you stand for? Because if, you know, like we were talking about, if there's an ally, what we're interested in is advancing these principles. 
And so it's not about me running. It's about come into the website, find out if I represent you. And, and my attitude for me has always been, I, I don't mind if people don't want to vote for me because they disagree with me. That's great. Then they should vote for the other person. I want to represent those principles that I, I can stand behind. And for those people that want to vote for that, they should have all that information to be able to do so. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me just address one point here. Denise asked kind of what's the logistics of running a campaign? And really um, the word run is operative there. You're, you're going to run from place to place. You're going to be talking to a lot of people. You're going to ask all the people in your community if you can um, come and have a cottage meeting at their house and if they'll invite their neighbors over. Uh, you're going to be putting up yard signs and asking for help there. Um, that's, I mean, in a nutshell, you're, you're just trying to become the, uh, the Mr. Rogers of your neighborhood that everybody uh, knows, likes, and trusts. And so does anybody have any final words uh, on that? I, I, I just want to thank everybody for, for being here and, and especially, you know, Lisa, Wendy, and Jenny for uh, coming on this uh, call, this webinar on short notice and um, sharing your experiences. Do you have any, any parting words uh, before I hit these resources and we end? I, the only thing is, is we do need good people running. It is such a key time right now, um, you know, to, to maintain that local control and that local, those local decisions. And, and we just need good people in there. So I'm appreciative of anybody that's considering. So. Amen. I also don't believe you should ever have a, a position that is unopposed because even if you don't win, having that dialogue and that debate helps to, uh, to make the, the person who ends up winning a better person in that office. And so um, I, I've had people say before, well, I, I can't possibly win. Like Jenny said, yeah, you're not going to win with that. Um, but it, it is very important for people to stand up and say, yeah, I, I can stand behind these principles and I'm happy to advocate for them. And even if you don't win, you influence that dialogue and debate. And please don't go away. Continue to be involved. I, I, I know one person who just because they lost the school board race didn't give up and kept going and, and was able to have, have an influence. So if you're passionate about these principles, you know, amass the people behind you and then don't just walk away regardless of how that election ends continue to help them become informed and involved um, in, because that makes a difference. Lisa? So my final thoughts, um, I don't know how religious everybody is on this, but um, always have um, asked to be on God's side in all of this. Um, you will have those moments of, of darkness, of loneliness, um, you know, craziness. Am I actually doing this? Um, you know, moments and um, to really go into every meeting or um, every situation with, uh, with prayer um, to be able to know and say the right things. Because sometimes you can be wrapped up in a meeting and you think you're doing the right thing and then you vote in the wrong way. And to have that discernment to come up all the time is, is crucial. And there's going to be hits and miss on votes that you're going to think, oh, I should have caught that. Um, be forgiving of yourself. Um, be human, um, and and really um, and and purposely set time away with your family. It's crucial to have your family on your side throughout this whole time. Uh, it's very valuable um, for that support. That you know how that support from your home is is um, sustaining you as you go into these meetings. It can be very frustrating uh, without it. So um, with those things in mind, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, feel free to contact me anytime. Oak, you can get in touch with Oak and they reach out to me um, anytime you need or if on any subject uh, pertaining to education, I'm here. Thank you again. I, and I just want to uh answer one question here from Jody. This is kind of a funny thing. She asked how much a, to plan on a, a campaign costing. Uh, it can vary quite a bit. I do know somebody that actually uh, won a seat on the state board 
uh, for about a hundred bucks and spent three weekends just putting flyers on cars at Walmart and got elected. Go figure. So it costs, it, I collected about $1,500 in grassroots money. No, no other outside people, uh, but uh, had $500 left over after winning about, so about $1,000 was how much it cost for my election. Yeah, it's just what's in your budget. And, and for a state board, um, you know, most of what you do if you are on a partisan election is going to be just convincing a room full of delegates. So your your costs are really, you know, your marketing materials uh, there and, you know, reaching out to those delegates, which uh, is going to be key. So, okay, let me, in closing, I'm just going to share a couple of uh, resources here. If you will jot this down, this is going to help you. Um, the Leadership Institute uh, is one of the online resources that you're going to want to go visit. They have, um, this was recommended to me by somebody I trust. I have not done this myself. So who is, who is it? Who's the teacher? I'm trying to remember. I, I don't know who the teacher is uh, on this. Th this is just an online, um, you sign up for free and then there's, 21 lessons in five modules that teaches you um, how to be a school board candidate and helps you set up your campaign. So 11 and a half hours of instruction, the program's free. It's leadershipinstitute.org slash school board. That's where you want to go to sign up. And then I saw this as well that was recommended. Um, this is a, a relatively new podcast. They've, they've uh, just got 10 episodes out. I, I don't know how new it is actually when it started, but um, they've got 10 episodes out. And this is to provide ongoing advice and support for school board campaigns. The Leadership Institute launched this, uh, the Learn Right podcast. It's available on Audible. I don't know if it's also on iTunes and other places. It probably is, but um, the School Board Campaign podcast. And, and honestly, I would start, if you haven't, I would start going to school board meetings, understand what you're getting in for and how it works and get familiar with the people that are there and what's happening in those meetings. And I think if you do that and check out these resources, um, you know, you're going to be a lot more successful. And I just echo what's been said. Thank you so much for considering running. Um, you know, we want to stay in touch and help you in any way we can. And so, you know, when I send out the email with this uh, video, feel free to share it with others. And, um, you know, we're here as a resource. We've got uh, a, a good bit of experience from people that have uh, been around the block on these things. And so with that, make sure you file by 5 p.m. on Friday, March 4th in Utah. And that is it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jenny, Wendy, and Lisa. Really appreciate your time tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.